Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There's no second best. Okay. Welcome to the Why Bitcoin Show with me, Dale Warburton. It's a weekly podcast on why Bitcoin matters and what makes it fundamentally different to every other crypto token in existence. I've seen firsthand how crypto really works, and my mission is to speak to the brightest minds on earth to help ordinary people distill crypto fact from fiction. Because as Lynn Olden says, and it's spot on, those that conflate Bitcoin and crypto simply don't understand either. All right, Chris, welcome to the show. Great to have you, man. Thanks for having me here, man. Yeah, really stoked to to chat to you today. Um, obviously, still buzzing from the a conference that we recently attended or that you hosted or organized. We're going to get into a bit of that. Yeah, I've really enjoyed getting to know you at uh, Bitcoin Bush Bash. I do regard you as being one of those chaps who is deeply principled, embodies the sort of, we're not here for the gains, we're here for the revolution. Yeah, I'm really stoked to have a chat to you today. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very nice compliment. And if I was to be known as those two things, then I'd be uh, very happy because I do think, or at least I try to hold myself to some level of principles. Whether they're right or wrong, I'm, I'm happy to argue with people, but at least to the way that I've found them. I try to stick to my principles uh, much more than, say, getting rich or anything like that. Totally, totally. And, you know, I, I reckon I'm a good judge of character. And so I can suss pretty quickly what people are about. So that was just my initial impression of you when I first met you. And it's been true to form thus far. So, yeah. I generally say the same thing, actually. Oh, really? 15 minutes of speaking with someone, I'm more or less, I know if we're on the same page and if we're going to get along and if we think the same or at least similar enough to be able to continue. Most, I'd say 95% of people I speak to within 15 minutes, I know. I know that. That's interesting. 15 minutes. I I maybe I make uh, I form judgments a bit quicker than that. So I, I usually go within the two minutes. I, I feel like I, I, feel I try like to I, be fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you definitely got more fairness in you than me, perhaps. So for those who don't know necessarily where you come from, your background, you can talk a little bit about your professional background if you like, or just kind of how you found yourself into the world of Bitcoin. How far back do we want to go? <laughs> the late eighties when you were conceived. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh geez i'm not that old come no, on no. <laughs> let's start just by you know what is your professional background share as much or as little as you like just so that it can give a lens to sort of how you approached it you know i come from a blended background of like law philosophy and commercial real estate so i looked at it very much like an investment jp underscore technology on twitter for those who don't know he's more of a technologist by trade so i would say you know he probably looks at it slightly differently to me yeah so my question would be more about like what lens did you have when you first encounter the Bitcoin phenomena? Yeah, sure. If we go back far enough growing up, I, I always remembered myself questioning a lot of things, not necessarily money per se, but grew up, I was quite interested in conspiracy theories and in different forms of thinking, I guess. Um, not not exclusively uh, conspiracy theories, of course, but just just yeah. I'm trying to understand things differently to, to how regular people, I guess, would understand them. Bit of an outcast of the family. My dad's a lot older than me, you know, several generations, well, not several, but two generations different, like he's pretty old. And then my brother's much older than me as well. So he's kind of in between. And so I kind of felt like I was a little bit outside of the family with no one to go to with my sort of extravagant and crazy ideas. Um, and so growing up in the 90s, the internet was a place to find other souls and find other crazy ideas to come across. Yeah. Um, but professionally, when I left high school, I found myself in a mechanical engineering apprenticeship. And so that was kind of like my first taste of professionalism. Didn't really know how I found myself there. I think actually my brother got me the job. But I guess the point I bring that up is what I found is a lot of engineers seem to understand whether it's mechanical, electrical, civil, computer, it, there's lots of different engineers. Mm -hmm. um, they all seem to be able to, I think maybe it's critical thinking or, or logical thinking perhaps is the common trait, but there may, there may be others as well. So yeah, I, I found myself kind of going down the, the rabbit hole of mechanical engineering and, and working in, in big steel shops and stuff like that, running machinery. Not really what I wanted to be doing, but kind of it was easy going and I was good at it. It wasn't until about 2016, so um, a little bit after I, I came across Bitcoin. I first came across Bitcoin around 2013, but not really in a serious capacity. 
Mm -hmm. um, through some of my internet craziness, I, I came across Bitcoin through the Silk Road. Like yeah. many people in, in sorry, I, I think I said 2013. It's more like 20, 2011, 2012 that, you know, I stumbled across Silk Road in my in my craziness on the internet and and heard about this Bitcoin thing. But I didn't read the white paper. I didn't, I didn't sort of dive any deeper. I was just like, oh, cool. It's like PayPal, but for like Tor and Silk Road and stuff. And okay, cool. You know, I wasn't overly technical. Uh, you know, I had an interest in computers, but I wasn't by any stretch computer scientist or, or a coder or anything like that. Um, but it piqued my interest, but not enough to unfortunately pick up the white paper. Um, it wasn't really even a thing people spoke about. Like if you knew, you knew. If you were part of the forums, then you probably found out about it. But otherwise, if you just kind of come across it casually, you're not really diving any deeper unless something really drags you in. And unfortunately, nothing did. Did. And then 2016, it was about 2015, 2016, I came across it again, uh, this time a little bit more seriously and did pick up the white paper. And that's kind of when it all fell into place for me, um, or at least you know, I started to take it a little bit more seriously and, and devote more of my time towards this thing called Bitcoin, which back then, you know, was known as this internet money thing, like many people before me have named it. But that's kind of where I first got started. 2016 was when I first started my um, my initial company or initial startup, CoinStop, which is just a reseller of hardware wallets. So all right, um, cool. Let's, problem, like, yeah, let's, let's stop let's right there, there for a sec. And then I want to just zone in on a couple of things. So what's really interesting about what you're saying is, I don't like talking about myself too much when I'm interviewing guests, but this, what you're saying about being, I don't want to call it the outcast because that's not a reasonable term, but being different within a family, I can definitely relate. Definitely somebody who questioned things, perhaps to a fault. Particularly if you told me to do something, I would probably just say no, because you've told me to do it. Um, and then Perhaps I'll do it later, but it's because I wanted to. I remember a situation <clears throat> when I was young, a teacher told me that the rhino was extinct and this was now third grade or whatnot. And I just said, that's not true. I've seen them with my own eyes. And she said, that's enough. <laughs> and the whole big fight. So it's so funny what you say is just having that sort of innate nature questioning things. And I think that's what makes, I guess, us unique in the sense that we're early because I suppose people that are less inclined to question things still don't quite get Bitcoin. And then the other thing with, you know, with regards to your sort of Bitcoin origin story is that, you know, you're, you're no different to almost everyone in the sense that you, you first encountered it and but its significance really did not resonate at that particular point in your life. And like all of us, much to our de detriment, I mean, certainly we'd all have liked to have jumped in a lot earlier. But when I've spoken with OGs, one of the things they've said is that it was so uncertain. It was so unclear how this was going to go. And even as late as sort of, oh, I'm going to butcher the dates now, but the block size walls, it was still not clear that this thing was actually going to work. That's kind of what I tend to think about when I go, oh, shit, I wish I decided to be a bit smarter and dig deeper. I kind of know, geez, I'm not sure I would have necessarily had that conviction early on. And so it's not surprising that you've gone along this journey talk to us now a little bit about that uh, coin stop which you mentioned there i i am reasonably familiar with it but perhaps for those who aren't uh yeah what's that about and uh how did you actually start the business i i moved to melbourne in in 2016 grew up in sydney spent my whole life there and that's where i was was doing all that me mechanical engineering stuff and then i can't i got made redundant actually the company closed down and so i saw that as an opportunity to kind of take my life in a new direction i didn't really see myself working working in a warehouse or a factory for the rest of my life. Um, I know you can be quite successful doing that. My, my father did for 40 years and he, he did very well for himself um, and for the family. Uh, but it's just not me for 40 years. I, I, I couldn't accept that. I had other urges and other itches that I wanted to scratch. Um, and so, yeah, took it as an opportunity to to kind of explore some of those urges. Part of that was moving interstate, which was just the, the classic take yourself to a new location to kind of really set in the fact that this is a, a clean slate, so to speak. Yeah. Wanted to explore something that genuinely interested me. And, and so the two things that I took a look at was business and technology, specifically software development and coding. I lived with a good friend of mine who was a software developer and still is, took a keen interest into some of the work that he was doing. And we speak about some, you know, what, it, what his role entailed, so to speak. And I just found it fascinating. I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. That kind of seems like it would work for me. It's effectively just problem solving. I enjoy problem solving. Maybe I'd like coding. But, you know, I always had this urge to also start a business and work for myself growing up. I don't really know what drove that, but I always thought it'd be cool. Like perhaps it's just one of those childhood dreams. Um, I also remember wanting to be a lawyer, but in 
you know, in hindsight, I don't think I would want to be a lawyer now, although I would probably be okay at it. Um, yeah. I wouldn't want to be one. So yeah, um, I found myself smack in the bang in the middle between those two desires and I ended up choosing computer science. So I went to university and, and studied a bit of computer science and kind of found out pretty quickly why I didn't go to university after high school because I didn't really like that style of learning. So after about 12 months, I dropped out and, and that's kind of when I, I re-looked at Bitcoin, took it more seriously and then effectively had had a need of my own that needed to be filled that couldn't be filled, which was secure my bitcoins, you know, on a hardware wallet. Mm -hmm. There were no, there were no, there was no way to get a hardware wallet in Australia uh, in 2015, 2016. Um, and so me and five buddies decided, well, that sounds like an opportunity. Why don't we start a business? Not really any any prior experience other than each of our professional and and some educational experience, but nothing super relevant. Like no one had an MBA or anything like that. Mm. <laughs> so we bought a box of, I think it was 10 back then. It was the HW1. So this is going back to 2015, 2016. Ledger's first device was the HW1 and the Nano. So this is even before the Nano S. And they wow. currently have the Nano S Plus. So these are like really, really early, early versions of Ledger hardware wallets. We bought, a, I remember we bought a box of 10. We rounded up a few hundred dollars each. I think it was about two and a half grand all, all together up. That was a lot of money for us back then because yeah. none of us had like professional careers, so to speak. We were all just kind of jumping from here to there. We had just moved interstate. So we were all a little bit all over the, over the place. But we took a punt. Uh, we, we, we thought there must be other people out there in Australia that are also struggling to secure their Bitcoins offline on hardware wallets. Um, and the only places to, to get the devices were from overseas and you know, they took a long time to get here. You had to often pay in a different currency. Like it just wasn't really set up for it. And so we said, oh, cool, this is an opportunity for us to be a reseller. So yeah, we took, we took the plunge. And um, at the same time, I also broke my leg. So I couldn't literally go to work anymore. So it was kind of at that point in time where I said, okay, well, I'm all in at this point. Like I, I kind of saw the early signs of the business was starting to take off and it was like kind of catching on and we were doing well. I thought, all right, well, that's me. I'm not going back ever again. I don't want to see the insides of a factory or a warehouse or anything like that that's for awesome. the rest of my life. That's a, it's almost like, I mean, you already were sort of 95% down the path, it sounds. And then it was a case of, oh, well, you know, like I, I can't actually do anything for the moment. And so I, I, I'm here and I'm, I'm all in. And it's really, it's what I find interesting about that story is, is that given the fact that you were so early, the fact that there was still an appetite in the market at that stage, it's, I, I, I would have underestimated the size, actually, you know, I would have said that there probably wouldn't have been a market, but it's, it's interesting that you say there was enough proof that this actually could work. That sort of just gave you impetus, impetus to say, all right. Now this is what I'm going to be doing. It's funny you mentioned law earlier because obviously that's what I did. Studied law, qualified, and I was like, absolutely not. I'm not doing this <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, you know, you spend the better part of seven years and you kind of realize, I realized within two weeks, this is not going to work. So it's pretty cool that that journey that you've gone on. And it sounds, I mean, just from having to have discussions with you, it's, it's a really fulfilling journey. So now, okay, so you've, you're selling hardware wallets and are there any other revenue streams within your business that you've now sort of diversified into over the years not a whole lot that was always a bit of a stepping stone for us it was our first business we kind of struck gold or bitcoin not many people do that most businesses fail let alone first time businesses but yeah we we did really well and i think we like the number one thing that we got like sort of almost perfect was our timing there wasn't anyone in the market, which, you know, can sometimes mean too early, but we also started the business in 2016, right at the end of 2016. And 2017 was the beginning of, you know, arguably the biggest kind of crypto uh, in, you can't see that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, giving, you the, yep. I'm giving you the inverted commas there. <laughs> yeah. Crypto uh, bull cycle that really like took off, you know, like that really put everything, including Bitcoin sort of on the mainstream map so that we were we rode that wave naturally and that first year of business was insane we went from that first 10 wallets in november 2016 to uh you know that same time in 2017 having sold over 10,000 devices by that stage unreal um and over a million dollars worth of revenue and we were just like holy shit <laughs> what has <laughs> happened here yeah that's incredible what a story hey 
but um, yeah, yeah, that that was that was largely timing, which we got um, in first mover advantage, which we you know did yeah. very well on. Um, the business itself is what it is today. It resells hardware wallets. It doesn't really do much more than that. We have a very small other revenue stream, which is offering one-on-one -on -one consultations to those that need um, sort of hand-holding mm -hmm. when it comes to setting up their wallets or taking a look at their security setup and all that sort of stuff. We're happy to sort of help people um, if, they, if they require it. There's plenty of like online resources, both on our blog and on YouTube and across the internet everywhere that most people can get for free. So, you know, we urge you to go there first. Mm. Um, but for some people, they really like having the so-called experts help them along the way. And so for those customers, we, you know, we offer that support where we can show them and teach them, you know, the responsibilities of, of holding their own keys and how to manage it the correct way. Totally. And that's the whole point of the space, really, you know, not your keys, not your coins. And it's cool that you've got a business that fundamentally embodies that, you know, and, and, you know, the ledger was my first sort of foray into the world of hardware wallets. And I think what most Bitcoiners tend to do is they'll start with something like that. And then maybe sort of over the, over the years, tighten things up with like a cold card and air gap, this and that, and a multi-seek here and there, but it's a really brilliant place to start for beginners. So shifting along now, um, obviously know that you're one of the organizers uh, along with two other folks for the Bitcoin Live conference that we just had. I've personally found it to be an absolute rip-roaring success. It was ballsy as all hell. I remember seeing chats in some of the Telegram groups that was just, I wouldn't call it negative, but it was people who would sort of saying, look, we've run the finances here. We've done our due diligence and there's just the economics don't stack up, man. And I don't know what I don't know what compelled you to say fuck that. I want to do it, and um, yeah, it, tell us about that story and how long you were thinking about it, and how you actually went and pulled the trigger, and what that whole experience was like. Yeah, it was it was a little crazy. This is what I love doing. To, to go back to a point I made earlier, where I was where I was tossing up between the two the two options, which were you know going down the the classical business route, maybe doing an MBA or something of that description, or the, the development route, I ended up choosing the, the computer science degree, which ended up being wrong. But I think I would have been wrong either way. I think where I actually live is smack bang in the middle, which I think by definition is something like entrepreneur. And so there isn't, I mean, I think now they actually do courses where they say they're entrepreneurial business driven courses, but it's all nonsense anyway to me. So just wanted to tie that in there anyway. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. What I've realized is the recipe, at least for my personal success, which is the way I define it, not necessarily in terms of dollar value or anything like that, but just what I want to be doing and how I want to be spending my life and how I want to be using my energy. What I found is I just solved my own problems. Coinstop, which I just described, you know, that was a problem of my own. I tried to secure my Bitcoins offline, couldn't find anywhere to do it started a business, solved my own problem. Same thing with Bitcoin Alive. I wanted to go to a Bitcoin only conference in Australia, somewhere close to home, didn't exist. I had to start it myself along with some help, of course. So it, it's a really simple recipe. What I've realized is I'm not that unique. I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm an average person, an average customer. So my problems are not that unique. They're just regular problems that regular folk also experience. So when I come across one, I look around and go, okay, well, is there a solution to this problem? As most people do, like, hey, I need new shoes. Where do I go to buy them? Plenty of shops exist to be able to buy new shoes. Where do I go when I want to scratch the itch of a Bitcoin conference in Australia? Currently, I can't. I have to go overseas for that. Okay, that seems like a problem. That's really costly and really difficult for most people to do. And it's, it requires a lot of effort. And so most people don't do it. And so why don't we bring that here? And I know it's been talked about a lot over the years. This isn't a unique idea by, by any stretch of the imagination, but I, in terms of actually pulling the trigger and, and, and doing it, I, I don't know if anyone have gotten at least this far in, in doing it, but I know there were a few people talking about it. And you know, again, timing. Timing is, is a very important element of this. Mm. And so hopefully we've gotten the timing right. I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed yourself. And we've heard a lot of other people say similar things as well, which is really um, positive and, and heartwarming. But yeah, it was just, it need, needed to happen. I wanted it to happen. I know there are hundreds of other people in Australia that also share that same desire. It just happens to be, you know, I'm one third of the party that pushes this ship in that direction. But 
you know, if it wasn't me, if it was you, Dale, like it would, you know, we'd all get behind you and we'd be pushing you in that direction. So like it, it had to happen. I just put my hand up. Brilliant. hundred percent. Hey, like, I mean, I can't tell you how much the community actually does support you. Like as we were out there and, you know, I've only been in the space for say literally three years of this month, you know, now sort of just forming a community, um, looking around, seeing so many familiar faces, people have come from all over the show and just walking on proverbial sunshine the whole time. It was just bloody great. I actually missed most of the sessions as did a lot of the people I spoke with, but just the conversations, you know, just the sense of everyone was so behind it. And it was just awesome to see the amounts of noobs and parents, like, you know, the, the odd orange pull story from, you know, some, someone being able to orange pull their dad and, you know, having that sort of um, those kinds of experiences, I think is what's really thrusting Bitcoin into mainstream consciousness. And then you sort of overlay banking failures and, you know, seizing assets from the truckers and the this and the that. And eventually I think these things fall into place. But this conference for me was kind of just laying the groundwork for what I think is going to become it's almost like a, a rite of passage for Bitcoin is down the track, you know, the little like Bitcoin Mecca for Australia, if you like, and you've got to go to a conference one day. And I was listening to a pod today. I mean, Miami in 2019 in San Francisco was 2000 um, odd folks. Uh, Bitcoin, sorry, Bitcoin conference in the US was 2000 folks in 2019. Something like they, they're expecting something like 25,000 for this year. So it just shows you how quickly things are going. And yeah, just to kind of repeat what I said, it's just the community is so firmly behind you guys and we're so stoked with what you've done and we're really grateful that somebody took initiative because um, bush bashes are rad, um, you know, but for some people who aren't able to get out into to the middle of the sticks and, you know, um, it really was epic to be able to get people coming. I was going to tie in a link there with uh, with a little bit of crypto because part of your journey has involved work and you know through coinstop you necessarily are supporting i guess you've got these hardware devices that necessarily support various types of you know we'll call them digital assets and in inverted commas or whatever the case may be and i'm interested to see how sort of your journey has progressed in terms of the way that you view crypto and i'm i'm talking here crypto as opposed to every everything else other than bitcoin but from those early days to where you are today, how, how have your views sort of developed and evolved on, on basically everything other than Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, again, I don't think I'm super unique perhaps in, in this regard. I think many people have probably come across this type of journey, but of course, you know, I came across Bitcoin first, 2011, that's all that really existed. Even 2015, when I came across it again, more seriously, you know, was still by far Dom the dominant one it still is today but it's obviously heavily diluted by tens of thousands of other coins and, and tokens out there on the market in 2023 but you know in 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 2017 um when we were seeing the explosion you know these uh smart contract platforms most notably ethereum you know the ico phase was was pretty crazy and you know i was sort of right smack bang in the middle of it i was in melbourne working at that stage sort of full time on CoinStop and, and everyone was buzzing. There was so much stuff going on, so many new projects. I was actually working at, at a co-working space, which was blockchain orientated. It did originally start out as the Bitcoin center, but later down the track rebranded to the, the blockchain center. Oh. Um, and so, you know, I was exposed to a lot of this stuff from the early days of the ICO all the way through the peaks where, you know, everybody and their dog had a website and a white paper and was selling some tokens in an ICO raise. So <clears throat> um, a lot of that stuff was pretty eye-opening. And as a, you know, full transparency, pretty noob business operator. I'd only been running on CoinStop for a little over 12 months at that stage. I was super fresh and super green, both professionally and I guess when it comes to the tech side of things, this was the first wave of new innovation, so to speak, I guess, that a lot of people saw. And so it was pretty easy to be fooled by some of the ideas. A lot of them were pretty nonsense and I, you know, I could see through a lot of that stuff. But you know, for a point in time there, it was, you know, I was tricked into thinking that blockchain was really going to solve a lot of problems. Yeah. It, 
you know, I think, again, I'm, I don't think I'm unique in, in the sense that other people also felt like maybe this thing was going to just absolutely explode and, you know, solve everything, you know, like logistics and tracking and this on a blockchain, that on a blockchain, you know, at one point people were putting chairs on blockchains. Like it was absolutely ridiculous. But so, you know, I, I call what's not, I've heard this off of another friend of mine, Alex, who who says it's like climbing Mount Stupid. You know, I agree, you know, for a bit there, I, I was climbing up Mount Stupid and I got to the top. I took a look at the view and thought, this stinks. So I'm going to come back down. And and I made my way back down to the bottom of Mount Stupid. And, and that's where I found myself in the kind of nice green fields surrounded by the rolling hills of, of Bitcoin. Um, but plenty of people are still stuck on Mount Stupid. Some people are camping up there. Some people inadvertently run out of oxygen at the top mm -hmm. and perhaps never make it down. But yeah, I think that that's the kind of general trajectory that I've found myself over the last sort of 10 years of being exposed to Bitcoin was obviously that was the only thing. And then all these other things. <laughs> and then yeah. you kind of get a little wiser, get a little older, start to understand some of the uh, more deeper principles at play. Because Bitcoin isn't simply just money. That alone is a very difficult concept topic to understand. And people will spend their entire lives thinking about simply just money and they will be experts of the field. But you know, money is just one element. There are, there are so many elements of Bitcoin and so many disciplines that you, you kind of need to be reasonably competent in. And so it takes time. It takes time to come to these levels of understanding with what you're looking at. And you know, I was distracted by a lot of the noise. It's kind of like walking into a casino. There's flashing lights and noises everywhere. And it's all there to just entice you into throwing a note in and, and, and having a punt. And that's the same thing kind of with the broader crypto space is like all these flashy lights and new toys and funny sounds trying to tempt you into your hard-earned capital uh, which ultimately often ends up going straight down the drain. 100%. And so thankfully, like, you know, over the years, I've come to block that out and, and have found myself quite firmly in the, in the Bitcoin only camp now. Yes. You know, we've, we've said this a couple of times in our discussion um, is that, you know, what your experiences aren't that unique in many ways. And, you know, what you've just shared there is, again, a typical story for the majority of Bitcoiners. We've all dabbled. I don't want to say all, uh, perhaps other than the purest of pure, but we've all dabbled in various forms of shitcoinery over the years. And even, you know, even myself who learned from the absolute best at the latest stage, you know, with the Lynn Aldens and everything like that. I still in September 21 was like, Do you know what, let's get a bit of this other stuff because it, it runs faster than Bitcoin and I'll get more Bitcoin. So, so there was my sort of entrance into shit coinery. Um, didn't fall for the narratives or anything, but still found myself alert to the shiny lights and the fact that this would run faster. And that's exactly the kind of fiat short-termism characterized by crypto. So we're all guilty of it to some uh, or lesser degree. And to that extent, I've always tried, although unsuccessfully, to be somewhat empathetic for people who are sitting atop shit mountain. Let's carry on with that analogy. I love it. Or, you know, are, are drinking the Kool-Aid and, um, you know, they they may be doing so completely and utterly ignorantly. And the only thing I would ask or hope from them is humility, intellectual humility to kind of acknowledge when the facts change, you change your position. And I think, um, you know, that that would be kind of my message to to anyone who's listening, who's perhaps sitting on, you know, on a pile of uh, other crypto and as well as Bitcoin is to sort of open your mind to the possibility that a lot of these things are potentially not what they they seem they are. Before we sort of dive into a little bit about now your specific focus on 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 Bitcoin, what was it about these sort of shiny things you've sort of spoken about at a very high level, but is there anything specific about crypto? And again, I'll put crypto in inverted commas because I tend to regard them as equity tokens. I just call them tokens. I wouldn't even call them currencies because that's, I think that's giving them too much credence. You know, what is it specifically about quote unquote crypto 
that you think is so fundamentally different to to Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a that's a good question and one that I've been trying to answer myself over those years over that same journey because again, like many others, I think it is often just pulled all together into the same sort of thing. Uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, all the same bucket of technology, whatever you want to call them. But as you kind of analyze a little bit more closely and really start to understand the principles at play, you, you do come to realize that Bitcoin is vastly different to crypto, to the rest of these tokens and coins. I, I think a, as I get deeper, I'm seeing that more clearly, that that gap is widening between the, the two different things to the point where I'm, I'm almost struggling to see the similarities because they just, they're just not really in the same ballpark of, of things. Uh, and again, it requires lots of understanding to, to get to that because like you need to know how money works before you can even begin to compare the two together. Mm. You know, Ethereum has often claimed to, you know, self-titled ultrasound money. I think they've largely moved away from that narrative obviously because it's not but but that that that's what it what a lot of ethereum a lot of the ethereum community called that was ultrasound money and you know i think that goes to show that that perhaps they don't really understand what sound money principles are to begin with that it's just just a meme and and that's how i see a lot of the crypto space is just experimental memes and like ideas and mm. that's fine like i don't even really care if people want to hold this stuff I've always said there's certainly money to be made, not the thing that drives me, but you know, people gamble on horses, people gamble on poker machines, lottery tickets, all sorts of things. They know what they're getting themselves into. They know the chances are very slim that they would win the jackpot or anything like that. And so, you know, whilst there's disappointment that they haven't won, it doesn't come at any surprise. You know, I see, I see crypto pretty much the same way. If I was to buy some Ethereum, not that I would, but I, I would do so no differently to how I would put my money on red, for instance, uh, perhaps that's better odds than putting my money on Ethereum. It's just gambling, right? Bitcoin is not, I don't see that the same way with Bitcoin. I, I see it as money. And, and so I treat it as such. And we can perhaps, you might want to get into some of this. You know, I set myself a challenge quite some time ago to not look at the price of Bitcoin in dollar terms. And I haven't done so. I think today it's about 493 days or something like that. I, I officially started counting on, on January 1st, 2022. So it was some time before then was when I last actively with my own accord checked yes. the price of Bitcoin. That doesn't mean I don't have an idea of what it is at certain points of time. Yes. I have had some people spoil the fun along that 493 days. Generally speaking, I have done my best to try to avoid that number. I am quote unquote, all in when it comes to Bitcoin. I, I price things in Bitcoin, kind of, kind of been doing a little bit more reading and listening to Jeff Booth. More I listen, the more I love. Yep. And wondered why I hadn't listened to more sooner. A lot of his thinking is pretty much my own thoughts, but put into nicer words. He just sees it incompatible between fiat and the Bitcoin system. They're completely different. So using one to measure the other is just, it's incompatible. It doesn't make any sense. And that's where the volatility and the confusion comes from when we're trying to compare the two assets. We're saying, here's this inflationary asset. Here's this deflationary asset. Let's try to put them together and see what, how it makes sense, which mm. it, you know, it, it doesn't. So I've been actively taking steps to move as much of my life into that Bitcoin system. That's a system that's ultimately going to win, or at least that's what I think. So why don't I get into it now? Uh, the, the confusion and the, and the difficulty comes between bouncing between the two. Well, I get paid in one and then I want to buy the other and then I need to do this. It's just like get as much of your life into the one that you want to be in that mm -hmm. you think is going to be successful. And that should be good. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bit crazy. <laughs> compared to I wouldn't average, say crazy. Average person. You're a psychopath. Um, You're a Bitcoin psychopath, dude. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is we what are. happens when you build lots and lots of conviction. You kind of, maybe you get a little bit blinded by it, but I don't know. I've, I've done a lot of thinking, a lot, a lot of thinking, and I've hung around a lot of smarter people than me. Yeah. When these much smarter people than me saying similar things to what I'm thinking, I'm like, either we're all wrong or mm. 
I might be onto something here. I like to think that I'm onto something. I guess time will tell. Yeah, well, me too, eh? <laughs> As Thank they you. say, we'll yeah. be dying on this hill. So Yeah, exactly. That's kind of my... That's my sense. I think uh, as far as, you know, sort of transitioning to a Bitcoin standard, as you've described, is actually quite easy in today, provided you've got you've got enough cash flow to be able to siphon off for your Bitcoin future. And you, you know, people would say, yeah, spend and replace and all that sort of thing. But the re the reality from my perspective is money coming in and money going out. If that's literally equal, your ability to engage with Bitcoin and unlock Bitcoin this value it's just to me that's that that's kind of incongruent that's difficult but if you can scroll away a percentage of whatever your fiat earnings are into your long-term savings there's probably not a better vehicle for you over the next decade you could maybe argue that there is some biotech stock that is currently <laughs> you know at like you know got a market cap of a 10 million dollars but it's you know if you talk about what network is going to accrue the most amount of capital over the coming decade particularly given the macro environment if i think back to my experience with say because obviously i'm a i'm an african as i like to say south african i went to the us for the first time in i think it was 2004 I believe it was around six us dollars at the time to the south african rand Today, it's 18. If you live in a globalized world, think about what's happened to your purchasing power as a schmuck who's been saving rands. It hasn't been a worthwhile journey. The, the smartest thing for you to do would have been to get into the best fiat currency of the lot. The, the best fiat currency would be obviously the US dollar. Part of what makes it hard for people here to see specifically in the likes of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, blah, 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 is that our fiat currency is melting, but albeit a lot slower than in developing nations where this is really easily understood. If you live in Lebanon, Turkey, Argentina, you know, perhaps to a lesser extent, South Africa, it's much easier to sell Bitcoin as your long-term savings to relative to the average Aussie. That's kind of what I've experienced thus far. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Largely speaking, our system works in terms of everyday life. You know, we can go down to the local grocery store, tap our card. No one's really sort of sweating like, oh, is it going to work? You know, is, is the internet good enough? Like the Australian economy for as broken as it is to its core, it's functioning for most people, for enough people not to be too concerned to be like up in arms, right? Obviously, everyone's feeling the pinch um, with, with some of the things that you've been saying. In inflation, cost of living, everything's going up in price no one's getting paid anymore. These are the early signs of doom. <laughs> and like you said, there's been thousands of yeah. fiat currencies over human history. Every single one of them has gone to zero. What makes us think that the Australian dollar is the special one or the US dollar is the special one? That would be really naive and quite frankly, statistically quite unlikely that this happens to be the time in human history where you no, know, we nailed it. I'm right. The fiat, this is the best fiat system. Now, this is by far the worst one we've probably ever had. And when that house of cards eventually comes crashing down, it's going to be very, very painful. But to your point before, and just to bring Jeff back into the conversation, because he's always got so many great thoughts, you know, you're talking about some of these other, other countries that are a little bit further down the roadmap when it comes to hyperinflation, Argentina, Lebanon, Turkey, you know, Venezuela, all these places that are experiencing, you know, some 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 areas triple digit inflation. The uptake of Bitcoin is still very low, um, even though they can see the problems in real time. It's not a slowly melting ice cap. It's like an ice cap that is violently crumbling and falling under the ocean. They still only have, you know, a handful of percent uptake of Bitcoin. So I don't know what it's going to take for people to to truly understand. Uh, are we going to need a hard reset? I don't know. Maybe maybe we can too experience triple digit inflation and kick the can down the road a little longer before actually really needing to reset the system. It's a wild thought, and um, it has been put out there. The U.S. or any of these developed nations could see you know triple digit inflation. It's difficult to conceive. Uh, once again, apologies for my dog having a good old shout out in the garden <laughs> but um it's difficult for us to conceive a situation living here where that could happen but if one has a look at a chart and i always like to say to people zoom out on a long enough time scale they all go to zero the only question is sort of the the pace of that and so given the unprecedented 
extent of debt that was taken on over the last couple of years to keep the economy afloat during COVID, the stimmy checks and, um, you know, the amount of money that got pumped into, you know, asset classes like real estate here in Australia, really creating a massive economic and political headache for the ruling class. Because how do you deal with a situation where the price, everyone has started using property as a sort of proxy for savings rather than actually saving money in a bank account. And in the process, it's become unaffordable. So a large chunk of your population is now completely disillusioned because they're like, I'm never going to get hold of this. I, I can't afford property. And so then what you have to do is if you want to essentially win elections, you got to basically say, all right, we're going to do X, Y, Z to help this group of people get on the property ladder. And so it continues. I don't know how this will end. All I know, though, is to Jeff's point, everything is becoming cheaper in Bitcoin terms over time. And so if, if your time horizon is in excess of, I tend to say, four years, generally speaking, I can't see how you'll lose purchasing power. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a whole lot more to add to that other than I agree. And, you know, for me, I've taken that step. I'm in that camp. I'm in the system that, that I think is going to win. So I'm ready whenever everyone else is ready to accept the future reality. I'll be here with open arms for many of the Bitcoin Citadel folks. <laughs> also exactly. be here welcoming everyone. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like everything is essentially being being swallowed up by Bitcoin as as Knut would say, you know, infinity divided by 21 million. And and again, as Jeff would say, the cost to, to, to create things is going down to the marginal cost, right? So it's just getting cheaper over time. Technology is is forcing that. Yeah, our system isn't built for such an outcome. So eventually something's going to have to give. I don't know either. Um, I don't know if anyone really knows. Like I'm sure we all have predictions. Um, if, if you kind of make enough predictions, or as I like to say, you throw enough darts at the dartboard, you hit bullseye eventually. I'll probably be wrong. You'll probably be wrong. Maybe we'll be close. Maybe some of it will be right. I don't know. But I can't really see it being so wrong that you know the system just cleanses itself. That's quite evident at this point. The only people that believe that generally have their head in the sand and are just being ignorant to, to the facts. Because it's it's literally what's the, like the classic meme where um, I'm not even sure what sort of animal it is, but sitting in the house where it's fire. It's like, this is fine. Like, that's what it feels like with the global economy right now. It's just like Jerome Powell sitting in that house where it's all on fire going, this is fine. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, it's, it's the, they're not in an envi enviable role. And I think as Lynn Alden tends to say from time to time, they say, what, what happens if, um, what happens if you're appointed, uh, you know, head of the federal reserve and said, I resign, you know, basically it's, it's a terrible job. It, it doesn't ultimately make sense to have a group of 12 individuals controlling the cost of capital that Im impacts the price of assets around the globe. But that's the system we have. And in the interim, we're going to just stack. As we wind down, I've got one last question. This sort of ties into the, my original statement of you being a very sort of principled Bitcoiner. I mean, there are perhaps a few Bitcoiners who are in it for the gains and, um, you know, want the uh, fuck you money at the end of the day. You know, you, you've you come in and for my sense is that you've got other reasons for, for being a Bitcoiner. People from the outside, I'd call them normies, don't quite understand the Bitcoin ethos. So... What is it about the Bitcoin ethos or Bitcoin specifically that resonates with you on a personal level? Yeah, wow, that's a very philosophical question. I find I find it identify on, on a lot of principles that Bitcoin's built on. And so for me, I want to be spending my life working on things that make me feel good. Sure, you can get rich and buy things that make you feel good. At the end of the day, like you run out of things or you, you're constantly chasing more money to buy more things to fill that gap. So I'm not really driven by that. In the back of my mind, I am in the sense that I'm choosing the best form of money to put my capital into and to put my energy into. So it's not like I don't care at all. I care so much that I've chosen the one that's that's the best at doing it. You know, in terms of, again, the, the dollar value, or at least of the system that the vast majority of people are currently in, the fiat system, I don't particularly care about that dollar value. It's a useless metric to me. What I'm interested in is the separation of Bitcoin from, well, sorry, sorry, not Bitcoin, the separation from money from state. And I think Bitcoin gives us that separation. And so I want to do whatever I can to be on that team, helping bring that forward however I can, whether that's uh, helping people secure 
their Bitcoins, putting on events so we can have public discussions and continue to bring Bitcoin into the public sphere where it is largely misrepresented or underrepresented. Yeah, whatever I can do to, to help bring that forward, that's where I want to be spending my time. I think the, the money side of things will take care of itself. You know, that's just, a, again, a personal belief because I have so much conviction in Bitcoin. So for me, I just want as much of it as I can get my hands on, trade anything for it, um, my time, my expertise, fiat, uh, w whatever, really, I'll mine it. Uh, I'll just get as my hands on as much of it as I can as possible. And I look at it in, in Satoshi terms, not in, not in dollar terms. I just want as many Satoshis as possible. It's because it is so multifaceted. There are so many different ways that you can come in and then you can explore. So, you know, what first got me interested in Bitcoin perhaps isn't the driving force as to what interests me the most now about Bitcoin. Um, you know, I'm many, many years down the rabbit hole. And so I've taken different journeys along the way and focused on different aspects of it at certain times. Um, and I, I imagine that will continue over time and ideally will form some collective hive mind around all of this as well. We've got the rules. The rules are clearly stated in the Bitcoin white paper that we all abide by, but socially, you know, we have to come up with that, I guess. And so what my Bitcoin ethos is perhaps won't, I, you know, perfectly align with someone else. That's fine. That's healthy. That's good. We want differing opinions. That's what helps battle test this thing. That's what helps quality assurance from the inside out, I guess. The users complaining and, and, and arguing with each other. These are all good things, I think, for Bitcoin. Spoke a little bit about this at the Bitcoin Alive conference in the final panel about Bitcoin literally being alive, like a living organism. Um, I think that that collective mm. hive mind of all of the Bitcoiners and all of the users and all of the node runners and miners and everyone part of the, the network, we're all one cog in that system that um that plays a role so yeah i don't know if yeah. mine is like the most high high ground not that i'm searching for it but it, it's mine it, it will continue can you continue to evolve i like to think i'm open-minded believed different things at different points in my life i'm sure in the future i'll continue to believe other things as well as new information becomes kind of available and that you know that's the kind of classic scientific mind right truth is kind of only relevant at that point in time because we might find new information at a later date which proves that previous truth wrong so it's time to update and that's kind of how i like to live as well well that's a great philosophy yeah? and to your point like everyone comes at it from a different angle perhaps where we start is not necessarily where we end or where we are today and as you say bitcoin's alive in the sense it constantly evolves and i think there's a lot of a lot of room for different opinions. One thing I'm always conscious of is all of us sort of sitting together in a bit of an echo chamber. For the most part, we probably share a lot of the same values. You know, some people might be more libertarian inclined. Others might be sort of more, could be more focused towards social justice. Um, I think that there's a role for Bitcoin in, in all of this. I mean, if you're, you know, just to use those two examples, you know, like, and we were saying, let's imagine you're living in the US. You know, if you're a Republican, Bitcoin's wonderful because it takes money out of the hands of the politicians and the central bank it represents freedom and what's better than freedom and then if you're a democrat you go well okay i care about these groups that i regard as being underrepresented uh, underrepresented or marginalized well what can bitcoin do for them well it's actually they are the people who suffer the most from inflation um, because inflation actually hurts the lower socioeconomic rungs of society the hardest so Bitcoin works for you too. So in that sense, it is actually, Bitcoin is for me the type of thing that it can mean something for, for different people. But I feel like at a foundational level, we share a lot of the same values. And I think that intellectual curiosity, certainly open-mindedness, because if you didn't have open-mindedness from the outset, you would have dismissed it and continue to dismiss it. Those, people those do. Kind of, they that's, do. That's also part of a lot of people's journeys is they they push back they push back it's a scam it's only used for drug dealers it's all illicit activity these are all the things that we heard through much of 2011 to 2000 and sort of 18 19 i mean even to this date it's still still a small narrative in in mainstream media that it's largely used for illicit activity but we've we've since proven otherwise i think but yeah like each of these little 
ad hominem attacks kind of strengthen Bitcoin. Every single time someone throws a little dagger, it bounces off, you know, it scars, you get harder tissue. And then next time, you know, it takes a, a stronger attack to, to break down that same tissue, so to speak. Yeah, so the, that's the thing I love about Bitcoin. Like, even if I hated it, I can't stop it. <laughs> it totally. Money for enemies. And if anyone's not really familiar with the Lindy effects and, and the notion of being anti-fragile, certainly have a look at that because, you know, Bitcoin at its core is those two things. The more people throw stuff at it, the stronger it becomes, you know, the more a country looks to ban it, the more it's an advertisement to say, hey, you actually want this stuff. And so the only way you can't ban it, you can only really ban yourself and your citizens from it. And even then they will find a way. So over a long enough time scale, I am just filled with so much hope and optimism. And this is partially because I'm associated with such a wonderful community of smart, open-minded, optimistic people who can see a bright orange future I feel really privileged to be a part of it yeah i think that's um those are all the main questions i have for you today i think given the role that my dog has played in today's discussion by being a shouter <laughs> unfortunately i want to dedicate this um this episode to uh your dog twiggy who i know 12 years ago a few like a few days ago uh had passed away and as a fellow dog lover i can tell you what like these uh, to me uh, dogs are the most special creatures on earth and i use that as one of my smell tests if you like about a person if you walk into my house and you don't greet my dog uh, that's already probably a sign i'm not going to be friends with you so <laughs> Yeah, mate, we'll ded dedicate this one to Twiggy because my boy Benny has been causing chaos and I'm not happy. <laughs> or maybe that was just his way of, of saying hi to Twigs. But yeah, thank you. That That's very nice. Like he was the classical man's best friend kind of dog. Um, oh, you lovely, know, man. If you're a dog person, you know, you get it. Like you said, like the minute you walk into someone's house and you see a dog, it's like, it's not like, oh, how do I protect myself so it doesn't jump on me? It's like, All right, I'm going in for pats. I'll come hug my friends later. <laughs> like dog people are crazy. Oh, we no, we are the best. Sorry to say. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, it's been uh, it's been really great uh, catching up with you, and um, kudos to you and the team for an amazing job at Bitcoin Alive. And we can't wait for for what uh, what's in store next year. Um, give the listeners a handoff to anywhere you want to direct them, and then uh, yeah, we can round out today. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks so much for having me on the pod. It's been um, great. I'm sure we could have kept going for another couple of hours. To be honest, there's so many different little rabbit holes that we could um, open up and really really get into so maybe we will again in the future but if people uh, want to stay in touch i'm probably most found on the bird app on twitter at long doge that's l-u-n-g-d-o-g-e and no nothing to do with dogecoin all that has to do with twigs the long doge who was a greyhound so that's the that's the meaning behind the, the handle on on the twitter Twitter app. Also, if you want to want to reach out, check out what we're doing at Bitcoin Alive. We're also on Twitter. Um, I think it's just at Bitcoin Alive, bitcoinalive.io website. Um, obviously, this year we've just passed the conference, so it's a bit of a long wait until the next one. But we'll be releasing some of the footage, well, pretty much all the footage, I should say. Momentarily, we're just kind of wrapping up some editing stuff. It's not my forte, so it takes a bit of time, but all the sessions will, will were recorded and will be released for everyone. Yeah, if you're interested in, in coming to next year's event, you know, stay tuned on our socials and our website and stuff like that for updates. We will be announcing some stuff for 2024 soon. I can't put a, an exact date on that, but we have some things that we want to tell people about so um yeah keep a keep an ear out for that sounds rad and uh for sure we will be looking out for that by the time this comes out the chances are that the uh, material will be released so that'll be great um i'm looking forward to to catching up on some of the presentations for sure and then the last thing i'll say before we go is you're committed to not looking at the price but your twitter avatar does have laser eyes so you're going to find out one day when you can move those laser eyes, okay, that you'll know what the price is that day. True. That's true. When yeah. everyone start, starts taking the eyes off, then I'll probably know we're at 100K. But um, Done yeah. deal. Awesome, I'll, man. I'll probably just keep them on anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. Awesome, man. Well, it's been great catching up. And uh, yeah, 100%, we'll talk again in the future. Hey? Take care, man. Thanks, mate. Thank you That's so great. much. See ya.
All right, so how'd you go with that? I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it made sense and that you got some value. If you have any feedback, good, bad or ugly, or any questions, I'd really like to hear from you. Uh, get in touch via Twitter, at Dale21M for 21 million. And if you found the episode useful or valuable in any way, please consider subscribing, giving it a five-star review, or otherwise just sharing it with a friend. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I'm not here to tell you what to invest in. I'm simply here to make sure that if you're going to invest in crypto outside of Bitcoin, that you do so with your eyes wide open. Much love, friends. Appreciate you all, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.